Don't let us interrupt. Uh, we're going to begin here. We have a standing room only crowd. Oh, it's Bob. He'll sit down eventually. So uh, this is Jonathan, and I am with. Jonathan is with me. I'm Erwin Schusett. Now, how many of you live in Hoboken? Just raise your hands. How many of you are aware that baseball was invented in the 19th century by Abner Doubleday in Cooperstown? How many? Raise your hand. Okay, you, okay, you have been misinformed. How many of you are aware that the first game of baseball ever was played in Hoboken in 1846? Raise your hands. You have been misled. <laughs> Jonathan is a researcher and an educator. I am a contrarian, but I'm also a huge baseball fan and especially of baseball history. Now, who invented baseball and where was baseball invented? D did you want to answer that question? Yes. Sorry, speak up. Abner Doubleday, that's wrong. Now, if you, he's got to learn. He's, he's in, this is school, this is a class. Um, there's your second guess might be Alexander Cartwright Correct. and you would be misinformed who invented baseball and where nobody invented baseball and it didn't happen anywhere. It evolved over not just decades, probably over centuries. This isn't my research. This is the research of people like John Thorne, David Block, this guy here. Um, baseball goes back. It probably was played during the Revolutionary War. It might not have been called baseball, but ball, bat, bases, scoring, that sort of thing. So Hoboken is not the cradle of baseball. However, you'll be reassured, Hoboken is a cradle of baseball. Without question, the history of baseball, Hoboken is pivotal in it, plays a big part in the evolution of baseball. How? Baseball was a recreational pursuit. It was just a game played by kids, maybe by adults. There were no leagues, no teams. There were no professionals. The rules were kind of uh, loosey-goosey. But at some point in the 1830s, they began to codify the game. You know, the, the first known rules to the game are from 1837 or 1838, I believe. And it was a New York team. Now, the game that was played in 1846, which has been chronicled as part of Hoboken's history, that game actually was play, and it was played where they say it was played. We know who played and what the score is. Therein lies the difference. It's the first known game of baseball, the first documented game of baseball. We know who played, who was on the teams, what the final score was, the date it was played, because the New York Knickerbockers were record keepers, among other things. They were bookkeepers. They kept books. Before that, no one thought to write down what was going on in a game. The Knickerbockers against the New York team in 1846, 23 to 1. You think, wow, one team was better than the other. No, there weren't two teams. There was one club. And they just said, let's get together and play on a certain day, game, a day, and they just split up into two squads. And basically, it was an intramural game. They were not two separate teams. Correct me if I'm wrong. That's the way it went. Okay. And, and, and the other part of it is the, the pioneer Knickerbockers got shellacked. Well, if they were the pioneer Knickerbockers and the, you know, the, the fathers of baseball, how could they lose 23 to 1 from a team that had never, you know, quote, unquote, technically never played before? So yep. it just reinforces you know, Erwin's point that the game was born of many fathers in many places, and many people were playing games with, with balls and sticks long before we, we know we know it as baseball. Abner Doubleday was a real person of significant achievements. Baseball was not among them. He had nothing to do with baseball at all, ever. It is a myth, and there's a reason why it's a myth, but that's for another time. Alexander Cartwright did play on the Knickerbockers, but he was one of many people who did, and there's no evidence whatsoever that he, in, that he really invented or codified the game. There were other so-called fathers of baseball who were more pivotal than Alexander Cartwright, but he's the only one who's in the Hall of Fame. And there's a lot of people who think he doesn't belong there. Now, 
Where does Hoboken fit into all this? Well, baseball was being played increasingly um, on the island of Manhattan, but hard as this is to believe, in the middle of the in the early and middle 19th century, they were running out of places to play baseball because of development in Manhattan. Lower Manhattan was being developed at such a rate that where ball games had been played were being uh, paved over, and they were building hotels and theaters and, and housing and whatever. So they were looking for places to play. So they went to two places. They went to Brooklyn and they went to Hoboken. Brooklyn, probably more than Hoboken, deserves to be the cradle of baseball. There were so many teams who played there and we know who their names are, what the scores were, where they played and how they evolved. But a lot of them were coming over to Hoboken to the Elysian Fields, which were the north east corner of Hoboken, where all those high rises are now, it was lush, verdant property. And there were at least two baseball fields there. And teams would come over on the ferry, squads, clubs, whatever you want to call them, would come over and have these recreational games in the Elysian fields. Now, this is where Jonathan's research comes in. Up until Jonathan came along uh, and made a discovery, there were only seven known artistic renderings of baseball being played at the Elysian Fields. And they are of varying quality, but Jonathan's gonna go through all seven of them. But Jonathan believes, and he, by the time you leave here, you will be believing too, he has discovered the first photographic evidence of baseball being played at Hoboken's Elysian Fields. And he's gonna explain in great detail why he believes that. Thank you, Erwin. So to just dovetail right off of that, when I began my research, um, I could not believe that because of how important Hoboken and the Elysian Fields were to the growth and evolution of the sport, that there weren't going to be more um, images, you know, de- you know, some type of uh, some graphical representation of, of the games being played here. Um, so I began to kind of delve into, you know, wh- you know, what are they? What, what are all of them? I'd like to know what they all were. So during the between the 1840s and 60s, the heyday of, of, of baseball at the Elysian Fields, there are only just seven artistic representations, um, all of them renderings, carving sketches or paintings, but I couldn't find any photographs until now. Uh, for the last three and a half years, I've been researching a photograph that we're going to dig into here in a little bit, much greater detail in just a little bit. But before we before we do that, um, I, I, I tweaked this presentation a little bit from the one I did in Cooperstown up in April, um, because we are in Hoboken. And I wanted to talk a little bit more about Hoboken and the Elysian Fields as time and place in the 1840s, 50s, and 60s. Baseball aside, so let's just go ahead and you know before we can enter into the Elysian Fields and the ball grounds, take a look at the locations that the folks, the pioneering baseball teams of the 1840s, would have had to first go through in order to make their way up into the Elysian Fields. So here's a map of the Hoboken Ferries right around 1845. And the image that we're going to talk about later on is from the mid-1860s. So it's from a different time. And the individuals who are portrayed in in, in the image might have come to Hoboken by way of a a slightly different way. But in the 1840s, this is the way that the the ball clubs would have made their way over. From New York's, you know, the Ninth Ward of New York City, the Eighth and Ninth Wards, they would have come over using the Hoboken Ferry, the Christopher Street Ferry, and made their way down to um, the the ferry landing in the southern part of Hoboken. Where the train terminal is now. Okay, where the train terminal is now. So this southern portion of Hoboken where the ferries landed um, was was called, it was an area called the Green. It was near a place called Otto College. Now this particular image is often mistaken or misrepresented as the Elysian Fields. It's not. Um, It is in fact the, uh, the, the ferry, the area near the ferry landing by First Street um, and the, it, it's very similar in terms of its, uh, it, you know, it, it representation to the to the areas in the Elysian Fields, but it's the, it's called just the green, and it's where the clubs would have come over or anybody would have come over if you're making your way from New York at that period of time into Hoboken to enjoy the Elysian Fields. Where is this image from? This is an image that it, it, it's all over the place. I have to go ahead and I'll track down exactly where it comes from. Is it a postcard? It's not a postcard. It was, um, it, I'm, I'm certain it was a wood, a, a wood carving. Um, and it was in one of the paper, the newspapers at the time. But if you look up Elysian Fields Hoboken, you'll often see this um, 
depicted or, or indicated as the Elysian Fields. It's not it's similar. I mean, it could, it could very well be in terms of the, the you know, the, the landscape, the dress, what the folks are doing there. But this is not that near you know, that first street ferry land, uh, ferry uh, crossing uh, where the clubs would have come in to, into Hoboken. And as they came into Hoboken for, at First Street, it made their way north along the river walk up into the Elysian Fields. This is what you would have encountered. Uh, this is a Bornet sketch, circa 1852, and when we kind of integrate it with the New York Daily Herald's um, our, uh, uh, account there from 1837, um, we kind of get a sense of what the river walk might have would have looked like, it might have felt like, if you were one of these clubs or visitors from the city making your way up into the Elysian Fields. I'll just give that a read in case you can't see it, but it talks about the uh, the beautiful walks. Um, and them, the, the, the erroneous information about them having been destroyed by recent improvements. And really, there was very little alteration made in the 1830s, uh, other, than, other than the fact that they were improved. It talks about the types of trees and in, in, uh, in vegetation that you would have seen along the river walk as you made your way north. Um, and there really was a river walk that began with a sign and it says, on your way to the Elysian Fields and Sybil's Cave. So if you were one of these clubs, one of these pioneering clubs in the mid-1840s or a visitor from the city, this is the way you would have made your way into the Elysian Fields at that point in time as the ferries were not yet landing, um, quite yet, not quite yet landing at the Elysian Fields. This is a really beautiful painting um, from 1832, and it was, it was uh, depicted in the New York Mirror at the time. And it shows individuals making their way, basically sauntering through, through the river walks, um, south to north with, the, with the, the North River or Hudson River there in the in the backdrop. And, you know, we, we know just from orientation that they are making their way north because the Hudson River would be to the east. So again, just an example and uh, a, a depiction of, of what these walkways might have looked like as you were making your way up through them into the Elysian Fields. They need to bring this back. <laughs> Get rid of all those high rises there. And just... So again, the artistic renderings are great in, the, in you know, the, the, aside from the seven ones that, that reflect baseball, there are quite a, quite a number that reflect all kinds of other manner of, of life and lifestyle in Hoboken and the Elysian Fields at the time. But this here is actually a photograph of the River Walk, uh, circa 1860s, um, I, probably around 1865 or so. Uh, but what it shows is what in, in, you know an actual depiction, a photographic depiction of the River Walk, looking north. So we see the you know the river there to to our you know be to your right, that would be to the east. And the river walk right there in front of us is, you know, northwards. And if you walked up long enough and far enough, you would walk directly up into the Elysian Fields. So now that we've kind of made our way across the river using one of the ferries, made it to the first street landing, landing at uh, Otto's College in the green, making your way north up the river walk, we, we actually get to the, uh, you know, the, the, the doorway of the Elysian Fields. And I think before we go too much further, we should kind of define what the Elysian Fields, you know, where, what, they, what they were and where they were. Um, so using a, a Hoboken city map here from 1841, it's an extraordinarily detailed map. It's actually, the map was on this screen earlier today, and it's one I encourage you to, to check out later when the presentation's over. It's incredibly detailed. And what it does, it gives us a really good idea of the Elysian Fields footprint at this point in time. So the Southern boundary would have been 8th Street Right, running down towards the Castle Point area, Sybil's Cave and the Grotto, right there at the right there at the bottom. If you just extend Eighth Street straight down, um, that's you know that would be the southern boundary. The eastern boundary is obviously the Hudson River itself. The northern boundary, depending on what map you look at and depending on you know what account you use of the Elysian Fields, is somewhere between Fifteenth and Sixteenth Street. Pretty much, it, it ended at Weehawken Cove. That was that was the the northernmost extension of the the Elysian Fields at the time. In the western boundary would have been the Hackensack or Bergen Turnpike, just depending on which way it was was labeled or identified on, on that particular map. So there you can see, you know, what we're what we're going to be talking about today in terms of the, the Elysian Fields and their their layout and their orientation. The one landmark that I think is very important to keep in mind because everything's kind of cent centered around this one this one particular one particular point is the Colonnade Pavilion. You can see it there, and it says Pavilion. It's a little little black mark. And it's right there, right around 12th Street, uh, the, the, where the pier is. Um, that's the pier that later on, the teams in the 18, later 1850s and 1860s were able to utilize as they came into Elysian Fields. The shot in, you know, into the Elysian Fields from New York was a little bit more direct than using that first street ferry landing. 
So keep, please keep in mind the Con 8 as our landmark because for this particular point in time, it is the only fixed structure in all of the Elysian fields. There were some huts and there were some, there were some other outbuildings. Um, the New York Yacht Club did have its headquarters in the Elysian fields. But for the sake of the, the, the athletic grounds and the sporting grounds and the baseball clubs, this is the area we really want to focus on. So we've made it. We've kind of made our way into the Elysian fields as we emerge from that, that those beautiful river walks, um, making our way north along the Hudson River, we emerge into the uh, into the Elysian fields themselves. Now, the uh, this is really interesting. This, this particular account that I found here comes from a, a Charleston Daily Courier. So it's a, it's a newspaper in, in, in the Carolinas talking about the beauty of the Hobo, of the Elysian Fields in Hoboken. And it talks about the promenades between Hoboken and the Elysian Fields and how beautiful and romantic they are to an extreme and how they are laid out with, I love this term, they are laid out with scrupulous exactitude, okay? Um, and so this is a pretty good reflection and depiction of what I think the area around the Colonnade Pavilion in the Elysian Fields looked like in the 1830s. Um, as you can see down closer to the river, that's you know there's there is that river walk, but it right up against the river, and the and the land itself did start to go ahead and in, in, in slope and grade up into the Elysian Fields Park itself. It was not a uniformly flat location uh, at this time by by any stretch. Um, it's pretty flat right now, um, but at the time there were you know we'll, we'll, we'll see this on some other accounts here. The, these these hills, uh, rolling hills, shrubberies, hills and dales. That made it a, um, a a park. It made it you know it wasn't um, wasn't like an athletic complex like we might think of today. It really was a park where they found space to play uh, in every nook and cranny. Another example, another another nice example of the Elysian Fields, circa 1850s, folks enjoying themselves. Um, you know, we'd kind of be remiss a little bit too if we didn't talk at least briefly or mention that aside from all the athletics being played there and it, it, it being a place for athletics. Um, it was really a pleasure grounds. The Stevens family established a, a pleasure grounds there that were enjoyed by folks, you know, the, who, had, who had no no interest in baseball or the cricketeers or the, or the aquatic sports. It was a place to come and enjoy oneself. It was a place to take advantage of some of the amusements. And when I, when I do say amusements, I, 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 I mean amusements. There was a, a little pleasure railway, a little railroad car that ran around a track. Um, there was a whirly gig that, that took folks on, on, on rides in circles. Um, it really was a, um, a kind of an all-purpose pleasure grounds for New Yorkers uh, during the 1840s, 50s, and 60s. And well, now that we've kind of we've made our way directly into the Elysian Fields, we've used the Riverwalk. We're standing there in front of the Colonnade Pavilion, right there along the Hudson. Um, we're going to turn around, look, you know, look west into the park, and ask ourselves where did the, where did the baseball take place? Where were these clubs playing? How are they utilizing this space that the Stevens family had seated them, uh, beginning in the 1840s? So let's go ahead and begin. Start take a look at the seven renderings of baseball that we do know of um, at this time. And some of you might be familiar with with some of them, or, or maybe even all of them. But that's them. That's it. There are from between the 1840s. When the the Knickerbockers established, you know, the, the Elysian Fields as their home grounds, right through the 1860s in the Civil War, when the Elysian Fields did start to give way to certainly give way to Brooklyn in terms in you know, deference to Brooklyn in terms of the epicenter of baseball, we have only seven known depictions of baseball play. Which, when I started this project, kind of surprised me just a little bit. I thought I thought I would find more. We'll look at each of them individually. The first one. The earliest one is from 1844. Um, it, it reflects it. it well, what it is is a ticket for a, um, a get together of the Magnolia Baseball Club. The Magnolia Baseball Club predates the Knickerbocker Club in the Elysian Fields. Um, they were, uh, you know, at, at operating in the Elysian Fields in Hoboken at least in 1843, if not a little bit earlier. Um, Irwin mentioned John Thorne, the esteemed uh, historian and official historian of Major League Baseball. He did a lot of work on this particular ticket um, some years ago when it was discovered. And what we're looking at here is, you know, if we were, if we were on a boat, let's say a platform in the, in the Hudson River and we are looking west, this is what we're, you know, what the, the artist is trying to uh, depict here. The Colonnade Pavilion is there to the, to the, into the right-hand side of the, of the image. And to the left, we see a group of men playing a game of baseball. We know it's baseball uh, for a variety of reasons. 
Um, and like I said, John Thorne, I just give him all the credit in the world for, for, for running it all down. But what this particular image, why it's important, it's well, number one, it's the first image reflecting baseball in the Elysian Fields. But it is also the earliest image of, of men playing baseball, adults playing baseball in the United States period. It is the earliest depiction of adults playing baseball that we have. Okay, so it is it is it is very significant, and it's significant for another reason that I, I, I won't jump into. But the Magnolia Club um, is is let's just say in the in the annals of history, kind of somewhat written out written out of them because of who they were, um, in terms of their gentlemanly status, maybe not being as high as some of the other clubs. Um, so it really also speaks to um, baseball's early caste system and who got to play baseball and who got to you know be credited for playing baseball at the time. So this is our first depiction. It is, it's obviously and clearly Hoboken. It's clearly the Elysian Fields. Um, but interestingly, you'll see that, you know, in terms of geography, and this really what my, what my research in, was predicated on was the layout and orientation of the fields. This wouldn't have been a place where they could have played baseball. It just would not have, the, the, the ground itself there would not have been suitable. Um, obviously it's an artistic rendering. So they wanted to go ahead and, and get that in there, which we're glad that they did. But that would have been a, you know, that would have been a wooded area, a slope, a slope hill. It would have been, you know, the, the, the river walk would have run right through there. So it's proximate and close to where baseball would have been played at the time, but not quite exactly. And that's the colonnade. That is the colonnade pavilion. Yeah. So they are playing for against our, our, our for spatial orientation purposes. They are playing in seemingly in front of the colonnade pavilion into the south of it. OK, there was a field to the south and we're going to get to that. But it wouldn't have been exactly where these where this image is uh, reflecting it. We don't get another image of baseball being played in the Elysian Fields again until 1857. So between 1844 and 1857, there's no rendering. And that 1844 ticket to just to just go back briefly, that wasn't for public consumption. That wasn't in a newspaper. It wasn't circulated. It was a ticket for the Magnolia Club, for a gathering of the Magnolia Club. So only Magnolia Club members would have, would have been privy to that ticket. So. Truth be told, there really was no image of baseball being played at the Elysian Fields of Hoboken for public consumption until 1857. So in 1857, we have this Porter Spirit of the Times. This is their rendering of a match between the Eagle Club and the Gotham Club. And uh, it's a fairly detailed image. You know, we see fans all over the field. Um, but, we, you know, we, we, can't, we, we can't extrapolate a whole heck of a lot from it. Um, you know, which field were they playing on? Is the is the orientation and layout proper? Is it, is it is it accurate? You know, to the ground at the time, you know, is that area behind the trees? I'm we sure it, we're sure it's the river, but there's not a whole heck of a lot of detail. The next image of this exact same contest, just in a different publication, lends us a little bit more detail. Actually, quite a bit more detail. So Porter's lens gives way to the New York Clipper depiction of the very same event. And this, you know, the, the Clipper rendering is is interesting because. In, in that 1850, September 1857 paper, they actually say that we have the correct rendering. I mean, I guess they knew Porter's had, the, you know, a sketch of it. And, you know, they made it very clear that their engraving is the correct representation. One thing we do know, it has a lot more detail. It is a lot more detail than the uh, than Porter's. Um, you know, it shows us that, you know, they, they are playing there on the river. You can see some of the sailboats on the river in the background. You can see a pier there, kind of towards the, 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 the th about three quarters of the way to the left. Of the of the sketch, um, and there's a there's a, a a relaxation and refreshment tent, a cooling tent that the Eagles, the home team for that day, set up for their female fans to enjoy. So there's a lot more detail in this particular rendering of the same event than there was in Porter's, which just lends you know back to the, the whole point of the presentation was we have renderings, but they're they're what the artist wants us to know about it, and uh, and, and and that's all that's all we could you know pull from it. So. The next image comes along in October of 1859, and it's printed in Harper's Weekly. So again, different, you know, a, a different representation of the grounds. Uh, we do see what I think is probably a similar cooling refreshment tent there. Um, but if we go back one, you'll see, just take a look at this, kind of take this one in, in the orientation and layout of this field. And if that's the same tent being depicted just in a little bit different way, Something's off. The, the, the orientation's off. The, 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 you know, the, the way in which the, the field is laid out is off. 
But this is the first particular, you know, this is the first image of the seven that actually shows um, New York on the other side of the Hudson River. This particular, this particular rendering, we actually do get to see the city there uh, across the river um, to the east, which is important when it comes to the photograph that we're going to explore in a little while. Um, this particular image is a generic one. It does not depict, just like the, the, the Eagle and Gotham image was depicted in the Clipper and Porters. This is not of a specific game uh, at all. It's just a generic rendering, but uh, but an important one because it lends us a little bit more um, uh, different, different details than the other two. The next one comes along in 1865. It was in Frank Leslie's Illustrated newspaper. This particular uh, depiction, well, you might, you know, odd right away, you're gonna probably see the tray. You're gonna wonder about the tray. We all wonder about the tray, by the way. <laughs> um, to this day, we all wonder about the tray. Seems a little dangerous. But this particular rendering is of a known game and known players on a known date and a known place and time. Um, this was the, Leslie's depiction of the, uh, the grand championship match between the Mutual Club and the Atlantic Club in August of 1865. Okay. So we do, we do know who these folks are, and that helps us out a little bit you know, when it, when it comes to the, the layout of the fields, which we'll get into in a few. I just want to add a little bit of context, historical context to here before we move along. And I think this is a great image. There's a lot of things you will not see in any of these images. For one, no gloves. They didn't have gloves. Gloves had not been invented yet. The pitchers are pitching underhanded. They didn't uh, start pitching overhand until I think the 1880s or 1890s. Furthermore, up until about 1859 or 1860, the pitcher really wasn't that much of an active agent in the game other than to lob the ball in. Baseball was about batting, fielding, and base running. It wasn't about the pitcher. It wasn't until a guy named Jim Creighton came along in 1859 and figured out a way to pitch underhand at such incredible velocity and to put movement on the ball that, uh, as uh, um, uh, Tom Gilbert says, uh, James, James Creighton weaponized the ball. So from that point on, the pitcher's role was to get the batter out. But up until that point, pitcher was just lobbing in the ball. Also, no stands, no stadiums, no parks. It's just an open field, maybe some spectators, probably not being charged admission to see this. Continue. They definitely weren't charged admission. So this is kind of deviating just slightly, but it's, it's, it's very interesting and important. The Stevens family hosted baseball, baseball clubs you know, for, for, for a couple of decades. But one of the things they, they, it seems like they weren't particularly enthused about were the giant crowds that would show up and attend the grand championship matches. And this, this here in 1865 was kind of the, the straw that broke the camel's back for them. There was, there were a ton of fans, um, throngs of fans actually, you know, trying to gain access to the Elysian fields. Um, it was not an enclosed grounds like the grounds in Brooklyn were. So without an enclosed grounds, everybody could just show up. Everybody can watch. They couldn't charge admission. They couldn't make a profit. Um, and it was, it was, it was right after this the, that the Stevens family made a decision that while they would continue to avail the grounds to all the amateur clubs for games and practices and, and get togethers, um, they would no longer permit championship matches to be held in the Elysian fields. So the, the mutual club, who was the, the one of the teams depicted in this image, uh, they continued to use the grounds as their, for practice, but they took their show on the road actually and played their matches uh, in Brooklyn. Uh, at the union grounds, I believe, where they can they could they could charge admission, uh, and where once you could charge admission, and this is you know an, another way that that, that early baseball kind of kind of deviates and gets off into different things is once you charge admission, then you could start. Uh, and there's an, there's an economy involved in the game. Then betting could be involved. And then once betting's involved, and throwing games can be involved, and all kinds of stuff that uh, that that. that that would lend itself to a whole nother presentation. It's in the mid 1860s that in Brooklyn, they actually began to yep. build what amounts to a stadium, a wooden enclosure where you had to pay admission to get in. The Union grounds and the Capitoline grounds were the first. Before that, everything was wide open. So this is image number five um, of baseball at the Elysian Fields. And it's a detailed one. And it's one we're gonna get back to later on simply because um, what it does do, it also it, this is one of the one of the images that gives us a, a very good orientation um, to a pl actual place on the ground. 
The next image is kind of a fantasy image, but it happens to be one of the most famous images of, of, of baseball of all time, certainly of the 19th century. It's probably one of the, the most desirable, valuable, and, and, and rare lithographs um, done by Courier and Ives in 1866. And here's the interesting thing. Courier and Ives marketed it as there's the image, my bad, sorry. So, and you might've all seen this one. It's like I said, very famous image. Courier and Ives claims that this image was of this game, okay? It was supposed to be a reflection of the grand championship match between the Atlantic Club and the Mutual Club just one year earlier in 1865. It looks, like, where's the tree, right? <laughs> So anyway, those are actual players <laughs> depicted. Right? Yeah. So in short, though, they're neither the they're, they're, it's it is not it is not the game between the Atlantics and the Mutuals from 1865. Again, I give credit to John Thorne and, and, and a colleague and friend of ours, Bob Thokes, who who dug deep into this particular image uh, and determined, found out that what it is is actually a, a fantasy game that never occurred between the Atlantic Club and the Excelsior Club of Brooklyn from 1860. Also, I want to point out that up until James Creighton came along in 1859, 1860, people played the game, but there were no stars. There were no heroes. There were no celebrities. They were just guys playing the game of baseball. James Creighton was the first acknowledged superstar of baseball. Throughout the 1860s, you do have players like, uh, like Joe Start, comes to mind, Candy Cummings, people who we now recognize as having been uh, just stellar players and, and coveted players. And they were the ones who eventually uh, made baseball into a commercial endeavor. They became the first professionals, especially the whole Cincinnati club. But again, that's for another time. So this image we could almost throw out completely as, ha as being representative of anything having to do with Hoboken in the Elysian Fields. Um, Game wasn't played there. Teams depicted aren't the teams that, they, that 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 are depicted there. And if we look at if we look at the grounds themselves, that tree line is hundreds and hundreds of feet away from where the you know the, the field would be. So you know where where does it fall into the uh, the the realm of all the other images we've seen so far? You know where is it in relation to the colonnade? Where is the river? Um, you know how far beyond that tree line is it? Is this is it the north field? Is it the south field? We don't know. We don't know anything from it. Um, other than that, it's a very desirable uh, image uh, and, and certainly a curiosity because, again, it, it's, it's a fantasy image of something that never really occurred. The seventh image, in my opinion, is, is probably the most compelling and most interesting. And it is, uh, this is one you might have seen, too, for those first, particularly for those of you who live in Hoboken. Um, it's the John Bachman painting from 1866. Um, and what it is, it's like it says there, it's a panorama of New York and its vicinity. Uh, and what we see in the in the foreground, in the bottom part of that 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 painting, um, is Hoboken. And you can see the Colonnade Pavilion right there, kind of in the middle. If we follow the river south just a little bit, we see the the the, the, the Stevens residence and Stevens Castle. And you follow it down a little bit further, you see that First Street ferry landing and all the different places that we we you know we we've talked about thus far. But what's really interesting is in that foreground, what Bachman chose to portray um, and, and deem important are two different baseball games, two different games of ball being played, one to the south of the pavilion and one to the north of the pavilion. And there, there are some you might think that, you know, anybody could paint anything they want. It's an artistic representation. It's a rendering. It's his conception of, of, of what was going on. A couple of things about John Bachman um, that, that I think we need to keep in mind when it comes to the, the accurate, potential accuracy of his painting. Uh, number one, Bachman did a, a, a bunch of these types of, of, of paintings throughout the New York area, throughout the 1840s and into the 1860s. He did a famous one of Brooklyn's Green, uh, uh, the cemetery in Brooklyn, um, Lower Manhattan, and this, this particular one is, is very famous as well. Art scholars, especially those that study the, you know, the, the works of the urban view makers at the time, stress that Bachman's renderings are among the most accurate of all renderings of, of, of the folks who did these types of, of, of paintings. Well, it looks like a bird's eye type of view taken from above. And obviously he didn't, you know, didn't have the luxury of, of actually physically being above it. Uh, these types of paintings were actually done 
uh, using a, a multitude of, of sketches, hundreds actually, done on a grid with some level of mathematical accuracy. So they're, they're not just kind of willy-nilly drawings of, of, of what somebody wanted us to, to see of, of this particular area of Hoboken at the time. It's also important to know that John Bachman lived in Hoboken from 1860 to 1864. So the likelihood that he visited the Elysian Fields and maybe even saw a game of ball being played is, is fairly high in the four years that he lived here. Um, it's my opinion that this act that, that this this rendering is is more accurate than not, and if nothing else, the spatial orientation of the south field in the north field or the lower field and upper field are quite accurate in relation to the colonnade pavilion that you see there in the middle of the screen. But as accurate as it might be, it's still a painting, a rendering, a, you know, a, a, a conception. So with so many of the, you know, so many, the seven of them being different, it really kind of leads to the, the, the question, you know, what, you know, what could we derive from that? And what would a photographic image of this, of this region of this area really mean? Um, and that's the question that we ask ourselves now as we springboard into the, the, the photograph, the carte de vista image that, um, that spawned every bit of this presentation that, that you're hearing today. Explain what a carte de visite is. It is that. So explain what the It is of. a... Um, but photography really didn't come about until the 1840s and 1850s. It was, not everybody had a little camera back then. It was a slow process to compose an image, expose the, uh, the mm -hmm. plate, to print it. It wasn't something you did quickly, which is why... There are, are no photographs of baseball in the 1840s and 1850s. I'm not a photography expert, but I've actually I had to look into a lot of photography in, in, in you know preparing this presentation and studying it. Prior to the 1860s, um, photography was done on glass, on metal, on different on different mediums. It was a it was a difficult it was actually quite a difficult process. It was called a wet plate process. But in the 1860s, the late very late 1850s. In 1860s, a process came about where photographers were able to create a carte de vista. It's a French. It's a it's a French word. Uh, it really just means a calling card. But it allowed photographers. It's again still a wet plate process and still not particularly easy. But it allowed it allowed photographers to to produce more photography more quickly and reproduce it. Um, it really boomed during the Civil War. The, 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 the era of the, the CDV was born during the Civil War where folks going away could leave images on the, themselves for their family members. Um, it was a way for citizens to, to, to buy and purchase images of famous Americans, images of you know, uh, the, the, king, the king or queen of England, of Abraham Lincoln. It, was, it, was, it provided individuals a way to finally get their hands on photography uh, of, of, um, of, all, of all kinds of stuff, particularly famous individuals. So what we have here um, is the photograph that we're, we all, you know, came to, to hear about today. Um, it is it is definitively dated between 1864 and 1866. It shows what we all can see with 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 our eyes here: so, uh, a, a a depiction of baseball subject matter taking place on a field, uh, a field with a moderate tree line to the rear. After the tree line is a body of water, and on the other side of that is another landmass. Explain the stamp. We are going to get to that oh. stamp. So, what do we know about the image first before we get to the reverse of it and we get to that stamp? It's pretty simple. Um, when I started examining it and kind of looking into this, I, I did it with no pretenses, um, no, no no preconceived notions of, of, of what I had or, or what it might be. Just what does it show? So, we see a group of men adults they're not children engaged in a game of baseball activity or some sort of baseball activity there's a striker the batter there's a hurler or the pitcher there's nine fielders and there's looks like there's some sort of base markers on the ground there are definitely something on the ground you know near the the, the rear leg of the the batter um it looks like base markers to me there's also an officiant there's somebody there Perhaps the scorer or an umpire hybrid is the gentleman there in the in the long white coat and top hat with the ledger in his hands behind the batter. Uh, looks to be keeping notes of the action. Again, you know we we have the, we have the geography. It's plain to see. It just is is what it is. Um, well, one thing we do know about photography at the time is that the scene was surely staged. 
there's no way they could have captured any sort of live game action or, or any action of, for, for, of, for, of that matter of any kind. A horse running wouldn't have been able to capture it on film at this time. So the image was staged. Um, and if you're going to stage an image, it always kind of says to me, well, why are you staging? You know, what would it be for? It's not for the heck of it. But that's what this is here. We see a group of, of, of nine men engaged in baseball activity staged on a ground, uh, you know, similar to, to, to what the Elysian fields would have looked like. If I could make a very short comment. Please. For the benefit of anyone who is young, the reason they, it had to be staged is the length of time it took to take a photograph. Anything in motion would have just been blurry. Indeed. Indeed. So we're, we're, we're fortunate to have it. And again, it lends, it lends to the question, why? You know, who were, who were these individuals? What were they doing? And the fact that somebody came out to take it, outdoor photography too at the time was was not particularly common. It was a cumbersome process. It was not. It was not easy to do. It took time. Um, some would even say it was, it was. It was complicated. Maybe even a little bit dangerous. The if you've seen the pictures during the Civil War of photographers in their traveling uh, dark rooms in, 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 in development studios, they had to take all of this stuff with them. This wasn't something they could take back to their studio and, and handle there. So this photographer who took this had his wagon with his de developing chemicals and all that right there on the scene. The camera was large, bulky, and probably and on a tripod. Absolutely. It wasn't handheld. So we looked a little bit about, you know, what do we, again, without any, you know, interpretation, we, we see what we see. Similar on the backside. What do we see here? The backside has a period, uh, before we get to the period notation, the stamp. The stamp is important. The stamp is important because it definitively dates photography from this period from August of 1864 to August of 1866. It was a measure devised by the federal government to help in part uh, pay for the, civil, the ongoing civil war. So all photography between August of 1864 and August of 1866 um, required tax, tax to be applied to it and a tax stamp affixed. It was a very, very <laughs> widely adhered to practice because the penalty for it was fairly extreme at the time. So it was easy enough to go ahead and you know, put the tax stamp on, have the buyer pay the tax. So because of that, we know that this image was was taken or the, the image was at least the image was taken and the, the, the card itself processed and sold between 1864 and 1866. We also have on the back of this, the, the, the image, a period notation that says a game of baseball, Hoboken, New Jersey. The ink toning, the color, the fading, the common variation of the Spencerian handwriting style all match the period, which led me, who's I've handled these types of images for, for, for going on 35 years, to determine that the, the inscription, a game of baseball, Hoboken, New Jersey, is completely original to the card. Um, I do have the, the, the image with me here today, and I you know we'll put it out a little bit later so you can take a look at it and you will see exactly what, what, what I see is that it was definitely not added at a later date. And it was, my, my thought is it was, thought and opinion is that was added at the time, just like we'd add the name of our uncle or aunt or ourselves at a birthday party or a, visiting Disneyland. Why would we, why would we mislabel it at the time? So there's no doubt that the subject matter depicted in the photograph is baseball activity, whether it's a game or a practice or what have you, it's baseball activity. We know it's from the period of 1864 to 1866. We have a pretty clear image, a very clear image in period inscription that reads a game of baseball, Hoboken, New Jersey. But just because the game might've been played or the practice or the, 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 the get together was in Hoboken, New Jersey, it doesn't necessarily mean it was at the Elysian Fields. And that's where we jump back into the Elysian Fields itself. Is the subject matter, we'll call it a game, reflected on the image being played at the Elysian Fields? Our contention is that the answer is yes. And we're gonna go and talk a little bit about why. So getting back to the Elysian Fields as a baseball venue in the 1860s, uh, I, you know, we, we must you know, look at it. The, the reality is that, that maybe even before the start of the Civil War, but certainly by the end of it, Brooklyn was becoming the, 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 the epicenter for, for baseball in, in, the, in you know, the New York area. So the Elysian Fields were, were starting to wane in terms of popularity, but not necessarily use, particularly for amateur clubs into the 1860s. There were a number of fields within the within the Elysian fields themselves. Um, 
and the subjects that were involved in that that that, that baseball scene on the Carte de Vista could have been in any one of them. We want to we, we're going to go ahead and try to figure out where they would have been. You know, which of the fields in the Elysian fields were they playing on? For that, we need to kind of have, go ahead and look at how the the actual grounds themselves were laid out at the time. The earliest depictions of De, the earliest descriptions of topography of the Elysian fields date back to the 1820s. This is a Long Island Star account from October of 1829 that is a, very, very detailed in terms of the, the you know, the Elysian fields, um, the history of the Elysian fields, the history of Stephen's um, uh, establishment of, of his residence and ownership of the Elysian fields. And in the, the bottom line in terms of topography is, you know, we know that it was not uniformly flat. We know that there were period accounts that talked extensively about the hills, dales, groves, and shrubberies of the park. Elevation within the Elysian fields ranged from five feet to nearly 100 feet, the closer you got to the Stevens residence at Castle Point. So where within the Elysian fields could baseball have been played if it was not all uniformly flat? Again, not quite the, 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 the athletic complexes that we're, we're used to today. You would have had to find a place to go that was suitable for a game of baseball. By the mid-1860s, which is the time frame for the, the CDV image that we're, we're exploring here today, a rail line and station, a formal rail line and station had been established in Hoboken in 1862. Housing and industry, as it was across the river, was starting to, to, to move, move ahead in Hoboken. Um, and the, some of the areas, the, the only locations in Hoboken that still provided eastward views free of fixed structures would have been those directly situated on the waterfront itself or those within the Elysian fields. Now, it's obvious that the scene that we have in the CDV wasn't directly situated from the waterfront. So the only location that it could have been taken in Hoboken was from somewhere within the Elysian Fields, but where? Before we get too far into the where part, we do have to talk about one other place in Hoboken that was important. Another athletic grounds that was, was pivotal to the growth of baseball um, at the time and, and almost eliminated as a possibility for the, the location of the image in the Carta Vista. In that area is St. George's Cricket Grounds. Now, the St. George's Cricket Grounds were located in the Fox Hill section of Hoboken, okay, west of the Elysian Fields. And if all the accounts are pretty correct, and some of the geography, the, the streets have changed. The, 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 that, that's one thing that Erwin and I talked about previously was, you know, from, from map to map, from decade to decade, the streets are, are labeled differently. But roughly right now, it's the present day location of Columbus Park in the JFK High School Athletic Field. So if you know where that is, that was the St. George, the location of the St. George's Cricket Grounds. And that's the, uh, the rectangle, the red yes. rectangle. Yep, yep. We see the, the, the Elysian Fields there is the, 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 the area to the, to the bottom of the area, the bottom of the uh, image, and the Fox Hill, air, roughly the Fox Hill area and St. George's Grounds are the red rectangle. Now, unlike some of the baseball, you know, so, you know the, the, we have the seven depictions of baseball. There's also a few depictions of cricket from this period uh, throughout the 1850s. But what they depict are somewhat different than what we have uh, in, in all the baseball renderings. There were fixed structures and enclosed structures at the St. George's Cricket Grounds. The grounds themselves were enclosed. So unlike the baseball grounds that were not enclosed, these were. The cricket grounds were all enclosed. Um, and of all the representations of these cricket grounds, um, there are no, there's no visage of New York uh, uh, apparent. Um, these areas was further west than the Elysian Fields. Um, the foliage uh, would have, you know, precluded that view. So in all of them, we see enclosed grounds, and we don't see any hint of New York. And even if a photo from this uh, locale existed, the Fox Hill section was so far far west of the Elysian Fields. Um, that a glimpse of New York would have been virtually impossible. So what I wanted to do, one of the things I wanted to do for those, for my, myself included, in terms of those who might be skeptical of the image and say, well, geez, you know, it seems like it was real far away for it to be right across the river from New York. So I wanted to kind of demonstrate that, you know, photography at this point in time, what you would have seen um, in something in, in, in a similar location. This is a stereo view image from 1860, from the, from the 1860s. It's taken directly from the Hoboken Riverfront, looking east towards New, to, towards New York. It is directly on the riverfront. It couldn't be it, any any further. It would be in the water. So that is Hoboken in, in, in the foreground, and that is New York in the further in the foreground. 
So despite the vantage point that is directly situated on the Hudson, New York still appears distant and faint with no discernible features, yet it's just one half mile away. This is completely in keeping with what we see in the CDV image. While the land masses are right across from one another, camera technology only affords us an impression of the opposite shoreline despite its proximity. So this supports the image reflected on the CDV as being well within a mile of New York. To kind of summarize, the image clearly cap our image clearly captures a view of the river in New York. It could not have been taken out of location as far west as the Cricket Hill, uh, the Fox Hill Cricket Grounds, and still reflect these same features. There are numerous accounts of baseball games being played at St. George's over time. Um, but this location can be excluded as the site of the baseball game being reflected on the CDV. With the cricket grounds ruled out, where do we have to look towards next? Okay, so we're going to move back onto the baseball grounds. In April of 1860, the New York Clipper ran an article that well, it just it, it, it was a schedule, a schedule of usage, teams and usage days for the Elysian Fields of Hoboken. You can see there. All the clubs listed on the left that utilized the Elysian Fields of Hoboken in the days that they would have had for practice and play. The Knickerbockers, Gotham's Eagle Empire, Mutual St. Nicholas, Jefferson, and a Hoboken club all utilized these grounds um, during the course of a, you know, a single week. So it was pretty crowded, actually. Uh, these fields were broken up into two, two distinct areas. There was the north ground and the south ground. The north ground being also referred to as the upper field and the south grounds being referred to as the lower field. Okay. Um, we know that these were, you know, we know that because they were very specifically mentioned in literature at the time. Uh, but let's go back to Bachman's uh, painting from 1866 for a little bit better perspective so you can get a sense of what, you know, the upper, lower, north, and south actually look like. So the south or lower field, This is the area that is south of the colonnade pavilion. Like I said, we'd get back to that utilizing the colonnade as our landmark. This is the south field, the lower field. The first field that you would actually, you would almost walk right into if you were using the river walk, walking from the south to the north, it would open up directly into the south field. Uh, these, were the, these were the grounds of the Knickerbocker Club, the pioneering Knickerbocker Club, and also the grounds of the Empire and Eagle Clubs, uh, also the Magnolia Club that we saw earlier from the 1844 ticket, this would have been the area that they would have actually been using um, if, if, the, if the artistic representation was a little bit more accurate. This is also the site later on of the well-known Maxwell House Coffee Factory. So if everybody is familiar with where the Maxwell House Coffee Factory stood, it would have been directly on these south grounds. This field was more proximate to the Hudson than its northern neighbor, um, as evidenced by the Bachman painting, which again, I feel is a little more accurate than not. In an interview given by an individual by the name of Doc Adams, um, in the, you know, well after the 1860s, claiming that he, he as a left-handed batter often was able to reach the river with his hits. Okay, so if you're a left-handed batter and you are able to bat left-handed and reach the river with a good shot, the only way you could have done that is on a field oriented in this fashion. There's also an account from a William Shepard, a lesser known Knickerbocker himself in the 1850s. He talks about the, the, the size of the field. And when he was walking on the river walk up from south to north, he, it opened up into a perfect greensward. And he estimated that the size of that, that area was 200 by 200 yards. So a fairly significant size field uh, there that the Knickerbockers played on. And again, this is the south or lower field. By the mid 1860s, the uh, the New York Mutual Club, who had established in 1850, I believe 1858, if it's not 1858, it's 1857. I think 58 became the primary grounds of the Mutual Club. This was really this was really their domain. Uh, because the Mutuals were such a successful and popular organization, there are many descriptions of these North Grounds where they played that help us to kind of get a better sense of the grounds. Uh, this is important. Because if we can identify uh, the, 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 the north and upper field and situate it, and we could do that with the southern field, we get a better sense for the other fields that also uh, were involved in the Elysian fields at the time. So again, the north field or upper field, as you can see, to the slightly to, to the north and west of the Colonnade Pavilion. In 1865, 
both the Brooklyn Union and the New York Clipper ran very, very detailed articles about what the New York Mutuals were doing on their grounds at this time. Now, if you recall the image that we looked at a little bit earlier from uh, Leslie's, Leslie's Illustrated newspaper uh, in August of 1865, uh, that of the, uh, depicting the championship match. These, these two articles here were just a couple months before that, and they really talk about the way in which the Mutual Club was getting their field ready for the season. And the bottom line here is that this was going to be one of the finest fields in the country that spring of 1865. And some of the improvements that were made on the grounds at the time were to install uh, seating that stretched from the third base side to the first base side around the back of the catcher's position, uh, accommodations for female fans, and lands, a great deal of landscaping was done to to the area between the Colonnade Pavilion all the way west to the railroad. Um, this is important because that in, in that spring of 1865, the Mutual Club leased the entirety of the Elysian Fields from the Colonnade to the railroad. They did this for a couple of reasons. One, obviously for space. They needed space because they're lesser clubs at the time. If, it, think, of, uh, think of ball clubs at this time as, as not a baseball team that we think of today. There might have been the, the first class team. There might have been the second class team. And there might have been a number of muffin clubs. They were called muffin clubs. They're, they're, they're lower level teams. Also called senior and junior clubs. So I guess I guess you could look at, look at it as like the, the, the major league club and then a bunch of minor league clubs. But all of them generally would get together on, on sometimes on similar days to practice or play. Well, the Mutuals rented this, this area so that their lesser level clubs could kind of get out of the way. They would have their own space to go practice and play while the first class team would occupy this newly renovated north upper field that was just to the north of the colonnade pavilion and these two articles speak specifically to that uh and in great detail so we now have the the, the first class club of the mutuals playing on that north field in their lesser level talent occupying grounds out west between the the, the back side of the colonnade pavilion and the hackensacker bergen turnpike so we get back to the image here, the image from the, 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 the grand championship match between the, uh, the Mutuals and Atlantics in 1865. And the New York Clipper ran an article in 1865 as well about going to the match, about the throngs of fans, the arrival times, uh, the, the challenges it, it took to, 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 to watch the game, to find a spot to watch the game. This, this, this particular match and accounts of it when combined with the artistic representations, all the different, it gives us the best idea possible of the way in which the north grounds of the Elysian Fields were laid out. Another thing that gives us a, 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 a hand here is a city map of, of Hoboken from 1881, coupled with a couple of accounts from the Brooklyn Daily Eagle in September of 1879. So you're thinking, you know, we're talking about an image from the mid 1860s. We're talking about teams who occupied the Elysian Fields in the 1840s. Well, th that's the funny thing about the research. In order to get the, the best picture possible, I went way back and I also went way forward. And I was fortunate enough to stumble into this, this map of, of, of Hoboken in 1881. And using these accounts from 1879, we know that this area that is directly you know, adjoining the Roddenberg's Tavern. Now, at the time it was called Roddenberg's Tavern. Before that, it was called Perry's Hotel. Before that, it was McCarty's Tavern. Regardless of what you called it, it was the Colonnade Pavilion. So in 1881, we still have the Colonnade Pavilion occupying a space in the Elysian Fields. Adjoining the Colonnade Pavilion, I'll call, call it Roddenberg's for, for, for the, you know, the chronology's sake, was the New Jersey Athletic Club opened a ball field that was 300 by 400 feet adjoining the, adjoining the, the, the tavern. And it was, the, it was an enclosed grounds, fully enclosed grounds with a high fence. And they referenced in the 1879 article it was the, it's located adjacent to Perry's Oat Hotel at the Elysian Fields and takes in the former infield of the old mutual club grounds. So when we had, we take in the imagery, we take in the maps from the 1840s, we take in the map from 1881, and we integrate all the accounts of it possible. We know that this ground was the north ground or the upper field occupied by the mutual club um, in the 1850s and 1860s. Because we could do that again, because we have the we have this one lone image, we have Bachman's painting, but we have all these different accounts. 
we're able to surmise that this is the way the upper or north field, the, the very important field within the, in the Elysian fields would have been laid out at, at least in 1865. Um, so utilizing, so we go back to the image with the tree, right? The tree is still ridiculous, but what we do see in there is we see we see we see a, a, a line of, of fans, okay, stretched out between behind third base and probably wrapped around the back of the catcher, maybe to first base. We see the batter there in the middle. If you look straight up that baseline, that's third base. So we see fans lined up there. We see them on the outbuildings and on the roof of the Colonnade and Perry's Hotel, which is an exact uh, exact replica of what we we read in the accounts. So if we take it all together and we kind of we we integrate it. This is the way I see the north or upper field looking in 1865, 1865 being oriented uh, you know, a little bit southwest. And that's where the Mutuals and Atlantics played their grand championship match. And further to the west in the area that we, we, we cannot see, but we have to kind of imagine, is the area where their lesser clubs would have also taken up residence and played and practiced their baseball games. Getting back to that New York Clipper listing of the teams that, that that occupied the Elysian Fields in 1860, we've talked about the Knickerbocker. We saw we saw we saw, we saw the um, we saw the renderings of the Gotham and Eagle com contest. Uh, we know the Mutuals played at the North Field, the the North Grounds or the Upper Field. There's another club there that that's worth mentioning because of where they played, the Jefferson Club of New York. Uh, the Jefferson Club was established in 1858. And actually, I'm working on a great deal of research right now on the Jefferson Club. This, this particular research spawned my interest in the Jefferson Club. But the Jefferson Club was established in 1858 and took a residence in, um, in the Elysian Fields of Hoboken as well. I didn't know where. You know, it doesn't say exactly where on the, on the schedule here. We just know what days they played. It doesn't even say, you know, whether they were the upper field, the lower field, south field, north field. But an article in the New York Clipper in 1864 there you see where it's highlighted. It talks about a cricket club having to, to relocate their grounds. The Manhattan Club had to relocate to new grounds in the, in the Elysian Fields. And their clubhouse adjoined the railroad. And the grounds that they played on are next to those formerly occupied by the Jefferson Club. So if their grounds, their clubhouse was next to the railroad, and the only place that the railroad ran through the Elysian Fields at that time was that northwestern corner of the Elysian Fields. We can surmise that that must have been where the Jefferson Club took up their residency as well and played their games or had their practices. If the Manhattan Club was occupying their former grounds. And I say former grounds because in 1864, the majority of the Jefferson Club was all fighting in the Civil War. So between 18, the, the summer of 1862 and the fall of 1864, the Jefferson Club really ceased to exist as an entity. They did send representatives to the, the national the, 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 the conference, and they did uh, they did maintain a, a a club, but they did not field the team for those years because of the war. But this must have been where they had to have played. Another hint we have is that in Charles Pavarelli's work, uh, Book of American Pastimes, he mentions the the clubhouse. In the club grounds of every every other one of these resident residential teams of the Elysian Fields, but the Jefferson Club. So all the other ones that you see there had a clubhouse, had club grounds, which would have been the outbuildings behind the colonnade. He specifically does not mention club grounds or clubhouse for the Jefferson Club. Maybe it's because they played too far away from the colonnade. And again, this area is not huge, but it's just interesting and worth noting that it, it's a it's a it's a interesting omission that everyone else had a club grounds besides the Jefferson Club. So there are grounds out further west, significant grounds out further west in the Elysian Fields than just the air the, the two main first class fields to the north and south of the Colonnade Pavilion. These grounds are interesting because we could definitively say that there was a south field the north field, there was a western field specifically identified. And that western field was specifically identified for play by the by the, the, the newspaper nines. So just about every organization at the time, every business, every neighborhood, they had clubs and they had teams. So besides the Mutuals and the Knickerbockers and the Gotham and the Eagle and the Jeffersons, everyone else that was playing 
organized matches, newspapermen, reporters, uh, postal, po postal workers, everybody would get together to play baseball. When they did, um, it seems as though they would play their games out on these Western fields. And it's, as we can see there, the Jefferson grounds, or the, the, the Jefferson club played on, you know, out West. So we know for sure, definitively, there was at least a third field, if not a fourth or fifth as well. Because when we, we look at the Elysian fields as a whole, we see more than just baseball grounds. So we see the upper upper of the north field where the Mutuals and Gothams played. We see where the, the, the lower field where the Knickerbocker, Magnolia, Eagle, and Empire clubs played. We see those extended grounds going out west between the back of the Colonnade Pavilion and the, and the Bergman Turnpike where some of the lesser level talent of the first class clubs took up um, took up residency. And up there in further west corner where that railroad would have cut the Elysian fields uh, was where the Jefferson Club would have taken up their residency, where the newspaper men would have played their games. We also see cricket grounds here within the Elysian fields, the grounds used for cricket at the foot of 9th Street. So again, these are just the, the baseball fields. A, a, a quick mention of the cricket. This doesn't take into account the New York Yacht, the New York Yacht Club, all the aquatic activities, all the other things that went on in the Elysian fields. It really was a, a, a pleasure grounds and a site for an, an abundance of athletics at the time. But as we get back to the image itself, the, the CDV image, and in summary, between 1864 and 1866, the very, very specific time frame from the image on the CDV, we know that the Mutual Club had an abundance of lesser level baseball activity occurring on those fields to the west between Perry's Hotel and the railroad. We also know that the reestablished Jefferson Club, who had come back from the Civil War in 1865, resumed playing on fields west of the hotel. Before we left, we know that they were playing on fields occupied to the west as well. We can be certain that there were more than just the north and south field identified within the broader confines of the Elysian fields. In fact, in 1867, we know the term several fields was used, so indicating potentially more than three. And we know that the western fields were distinctly used, identified and utilized for the newspaper nines to play their games. And we know that the newspaper nines used the Jefferson grounds. When we put all this stuff together, keeping in mind that the, some of the western extent, the westerly extending fields sat at slightly higher elevations than the first class riverfront grounds. So after we take all this into account, all the geography, all the accounts, the known artistic representation, uh, we believe that the 1864 to 1866 image of baseball subject matter was indeed taken within the confines of the Elysian fields. And if I had to put my finger on a map, that's where I would place it, out towards the west, just just inside the, the, the boundary of the Elysian Fields by the Bergen Turnpike, where the railroad would have cut through the grounds. And if we take a look at the image, a kind of colorized, an enhanced and colorized image, um, we can see that if we were standing on those western grounds that were sat at slightly higher elevations, and we were a team of newspapermen practicing or playing a game. And the photographer was taking our picture, looking eastwards across the balance of the Elysian Fields, across the Hudson and towards New York. This is pretty much what we would expect to see at the time, given the uh, technology of the photography uh, and given the, uh, the, the, the organic uh, elements of this particular image. Were newspapers reproducing photographs by then? They were not. I do, and I, and I have, I'm remiss in not looking into when they did, but I, I know that it was not yet this early. So they wouldn't have had a staff photographer on the newspaper? I don't believe so, but I, I think if you were a newspaperman, you might also have some familiarity with the photographers of your I area. I was just thinking this could be a newspaper mine. So if I, that would be, again, we're, we will never know for sure. I mean, we will never be able to identify who these individuals were. We don't know. Were. We don't know. The future is uncharted. But given the geography, Given what we know about the, the these newspaper nines and these amateur clubs playing in these western grounds, uh, just looking at the geography and the fact that they're they look like newspaper men to me, or at least you know, you know that 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 would be my guess. But the important part is that I think we've been able to establish that the image does does emanate from within the Elysian Fields uh, themselves. Q and A. Let's give it a pause. How many how many years have you been researching this? 
I've been, I worked on the presentation for about three and a half years um, before I, I presented it for the first time um, up at the 19th century, Sabres 19th century uh, conference in Cooperstown in April. Um, I had intended to do it before then. Obviously, we got sidetracked because of the COVID year. Um, but I've been interested in the image, obviously, ever since I got it. I wouldn't you know, have, a, have acquired it had I not had interest in it. But I, at the time, when I, when I began looking into it, I just assumed that there must have been other photography. There had to have been another photograph taken of baseball subject matter within the Elysian fields. And there may be. We just don't know. There may be. Uh, we, if there is, we're not aware of it. And when I say we, I'm not aware of it. The former research librarian at the Hall of Fame is not aware of it. The current photo archivist at the Hall of Fame isn't aware of it. And no other historian that I've spoken with is aware of any. So to Irwin's point, we are in an age where things pop up every day. New discoveries are being are being made. But at this point in time, I believe what we're looking at is the only known image of, of, of baseball being, you know, baseball subject matter reflected at the Elysian Fields. And there is a second. There's a second exact copy of this, which is what CDV tech, photography and technology was all about. It allowed, it allowed for the reproduction of photography. Um, so there is, an, there is another, in, in, it exists in New Jersey, it, re, it resides in New Jersey as well, but there is another copy of this particular image uh, out there. Yes, I have a two-part question. Sure. The first part is, how did you learn about this image and come about to acquire it? And the second question is, given the origins of quote-unquote Cooperstown, how did they react to your lecture there? I can answer the Cooperstown part, right. but if you want to explain how you uh I bought it. Um a very good how did you locate uh, it? I didn't. It was brought to my it was brought to my attention. Um, you should explain what you what are the other your other interests are baseball uniforms, the history of baseball uniforms. You're a collector. I am a collector of, of of vintage baseball equipment. My 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 interest is 19th century equipment and virtually all of my research to this point, not all of it, but most of it has been on 19th century equipment, uh, uniforms, things of that nature. The first several presentations I did in Cooperstown for the 19th century committee were on uh, equipment, sporting goods manufacturers, that type of thing. Um, so I am a collector. I've been collecting for well over 30 years now. Um, this particular image uh, was brought to my attention by a fellow collector, a fellow member of the 19th, Sabres 19th Century Research Committee. Um, who is a longtime, well-respected, well-regarded collector of high-end baseball photography and imagery. Um, and he lives in New York. I live in New Jersey. He was divesting and parting, you know, parting with some of his items. So he thought being in, you know, in New Jersey and having interest in New Jersey, I would, uh, I would be interested. I certainly was. So I, I purchased the photograph from him. Again, having no conception whatsoever that it might be the only known image reflecting baseball subject matter at the Elysian Fields. I bought it, what I bought it really for was because it's a rare image of outdoor, reflecting outdoor baseball play. Um, for the for the reasons we spoke about earlier in the presentation, having an image of, 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 of outdoor baseball subject matter or gameplay, again, I say gameplay, we know that it was staged, um, is rare in and of itself. If this wasn't the Elysian Fields of, of Hoboken, New Jersey, and it was anywhere else, I still would have been very, very interested in having it simply because of the depiction of the game, of the, the, the gameplay. If I can have a very quick redirect on that, what did the collector who sold it to you think about it? Uh, aside from the fact that it's old. Same thing. Nice image, John, you might like it. You know, it had been his collection for a long time. I think he had another one or two images of, of outdoor outdoor gameplay. Um, it was offered to me. And when I purchased it, I like I said, I, I, I've been researching it for three years. I've had it for eight or nine. So I've had it for a, a long, long time before I even really dug it out and looked back into it. You know, I kind of, I kind of dig around the collection. I kind of, I, I do like to research or work on research things that have to do with something in my collection, so that I could bring something to to the to the conference or bring something to people that they could see, they could touch, they could feel. Just to finally clarify mm -hmm. for me, so nobody really paid attention to the inscription on the back until you thought about it a second time. Whether they whether they paid attention or just thought like I did that there must be a bunch of photographs of baseball play at the Elysian. How could there not be? It, you know, what Irwin said earlier, it was such a pivotal location in the 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 growth and evolution of the early game. There must have been more photography, it's just that there wasn't.
So it was really kind of fortuitous. And your question about what what was the reaction to Cooperstown, there's an implication there that what did the people at Cooperstown think of this? We well, have to understand the people at Cooperstown who were present at this presentation don't live in Cooperstown. Then now you're wondering perhaps why is the Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown when I've already said that Alexander uh, uh, Abner Doubleday didn't invent baseball in Cooperstown. He didn't invent baseball, period. And baseball did not originate in Cooperstown. Why is the Hall of Fame there? It's a long, complicated story having to do with the, something called the Mills Commission back uh, a century... 1908. 1908, determining that they were looking for an American origin of baseball, and they wanted a story. And somehow, very complicated, they came upon Abner Doubleday, who was deceased at that point. But they pieced together the testimony, actually, the testimony of one guy named Abner Graves. Said he saw Abner Doubleday sketch out a baseball field in Cooperstown in 1839 and tell everybody, hey, we're going to play this game, and here's how it's played, and we're going to play. And based on the testimony of a, I think he was in his 80s or 90s, they decided that's all the evidence we need. Baseball originated in Cooperstown. It was invented by an American hero. He was an American Civil War hero. He left behind 67 diaries, none of which mentioned baseball. The, the other interesting thing about Admiral Graves, that, so the, the, their main witness to the invention of baseball also murdered his wife and died in the same asylum. However, there's a big however. There's a big however. My girlfriend Lisa will, will appreciate this because I shared this with her. There's a baseball historian, Craig Wright. Do you know him? I've heard, yeah. And he does a thing called uh, Pages from Baseball's Past. It's a little subscription thing he mails out. He did a three-part uh, 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 historical overview of another guy named Abner Doubleday who did leave, live in Cooperstown and might have known Abner Graves, but there's no... Abner Graves was mentioning the name Abner Doubleday. He did know a guy named Abner Doubleday in Cooperstown, and maybe they played baseball at some point. But somehow, at that point, he was insane. He'd murdered his wife. He was an elderly man. Uh, he's not in Colorado. And they, they brought him to New York and had him testify. And he's, and he's conflating two different Abner Doubledays. So there actually may be some truth to Abner, to Abner Graves' testimony that there was a guy named Abner Doubleday in Cooperstown. It just wasn't the same Abner Doubleday. And Craig Wright just connected so many dots. It was so impressive that I came away with a little different, a little more uh, respect for Abner Graves, who has been quite dismissed as uh, a source of baseball's origins. So what do the people of Cooperstown think? They're nerds. They're proto ball nerds. They're geeks like me. I was up there. Nobody's from Cooperstown. They're from all, they just descend upon Cooperstown as a swarm every year for this conference called the Fred, named after Frederick Ivor Campbell, to discuss 19th century baseball. Cuts off in 1900. That's it. Anything after that, it better have started in the, in the 19th century. So these are serious researchers, serious historians. These aren't people you want to fool with myths and speculation. No speculation, facts. They were very, I was there. I was so impressed with it. I said, could you come to Hoboken and do this presentation? It's like, a, it's like performing for, you know, if you were, a, you played the violin, you had to perform for, 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 for Beethoven or Bach in front of that. It, it is an intimidating group. Um, it's a very, it is a wonderful group, very friendly group, but they're, they're so, so learned and educated. They are true scholars in this area, researchers and authors. Um, they're entertaining too. They're yes, funny. very entertaining. But it was, it was. I will say it was, it was, it was val It was validating um, that that the track I, I had taken was, you know, it, it loaded with research was might have been the right track. Um, and I was very open to the fact that there might have been consenting views, opinions, and thoughts as well. I mean, that's what research is, is all is all about. And I think as we continue as, as researchers of any kind, baseball or, or otherwise, um, as more, more information becomes available, more resources are digitized, more folks find more things, um, certainly this, this, this can change. Jack? Yeah, so a question that I was having uh, uh, during it and combined with what Erwin just, just said about the scholarship, the nerdy, and I, I can speak to that because Erwin brought me along to one of these uh, 
I prefer the modern game. <laughs> um, but it's it's interesting to me as a person interested in, in history that there isn't a photography scholar of night like is you know are there many photographs of the Brooklyn game or is there a famous first known just photo um, it's, a, it's a really good question and I guess we'd have to track down all the potential firsts um, I didn't look for all the firsts I I sought out the individuals who might know that answer better than myself that's why I went ended up you know speaking directly to and reaching out to you know, the, the, the former research librarian at the hall, the current photo archivist, the current photo archivist at, at the Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown said there, there in, in their archives and their records, there are there was no photography. There was no imagery, right. f- photographic imagery of baseball subject matter at the Elysian Fields. So right. that that kind of was, you know, that was a very definitive answer. Um, and it also kind of put me back on the track of, well, if they don't have any, certainly somebody could find something. But right now, that there's 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 none known to exist. Um, in terms of the other areas, I think we just have to work on it. I mean, I think it's it's, it's it'd be wonderful research to to take an image and you know track it backwards. Is it is it the first? What does it show? Where is it? There's a lot of photographs of players in the 19th century, but again, because of the nature of the technology, the long time needed for uh, an exposure, they're posed, and rather than showing them at on a field, at play, you can't capture action. So you have all these photographs, and often they're the the carte de visites of famous players, Order O'Rourke, King Kelly, whatever, and they're in a studio with a trompe l'oeil behind them. Not even a baseball trompe, it's just a bunch of trees or something. And they're like this, and there's a ball on a string hanging in front of them, and it's like they're catching a ball, or they're there with a bat, or they're leaning on their bat, and and they're they're being told by the photographer, don't move, do not move. And there's probably a brace maybe behind their neck. Yeah. There's, that, that's there's, the way they took photography there's actually back then. Plenty of photographs of personalities involved in baseball play, not the playing, of home not game. playing the game though. You know, images of of George and Harry Wright, images of Henry Henry Chadwick, Cartwright, Do, you know, Doc Adams, the Knickerbockers. There is photography of the the people and personalities, studio based imagery uh, of folks who frequented the Elysian Fields, but not in you know, uh, uh, you know, a gameplay or or you know something reflective of the grounds itself. I mentioned James Creighton before, and you should look him up. He's just an amazing. He, What's amazing about Creighton, there's, there's four people who really changed the course of baseball history. And I asked John Thorne about them, because mm-hmm. to me, uh, Babe Ruth, unquite, there's before Babe Ruth and there's after Babe Ruth. He really changed the way the game is played. There's Jackie Robinson. There's no question. It's a different game before Jackie Robinson. And I thought James Creighton, who pitched from 1859, follow me here, 1859 to 1860, then he didn't pitch in 61 because of the Civil War. Players were off. Then he pitched in 1862, and then he died. He was 21. He changed the course of baseball history by weaponizing the ball. He figured out how to do it, and we don't know how he did it. There's two known pictures of Creighton. One is posed, and the other, he's standing there with kind of as if he's about to throw the ball. You can look at his wiki page and you can see it there, but you don't know how he's holding it. You don't know how he releases it. You don't know the position of his arm. There is nothing. There are a couple of eyewitness accounts, but even they don't know what he was doing and how he he managed to fool the batters the way no pitcher ever had before. And from that point on, everybody wanted to copy Creighton. And the, the fourth person, when I asked John Thorne, was really a surprising answer. The fourth most pivotal person in the history of changing the game was a guy who was not a player. It's Bill James. Ah. Bill James created sabermetrics. Bill James redefined the way you measure the effectiveness of, of a player. And baseball was never the same after that because all these players that we thought were really great, looking back, Bill James proved, eh, they're above average. And other players who we thought were kind of marginal, wow, they were really effective. Because there's only one thing a ball player needs to do. And it's all summed up in what somebody said about Eddie Stanky. He can't run, he can't throw, he can't hit, and he can't field. All he can do is beat you. 
So winning is all that it's about. And that means scoring runs across the plate. Um, so just back to the image. Um, so where do we think this was taken? So to the west. Yeah. If I, had, if I had to guess, based upon just the, what, what, what's inherent in the image itself, you know, what we see, the geography, uh, in, the, in the direction, you know, the, the only way that this image could have been captured, let me... 10th, 11th, 12th. It's between 12th and 13th. So that's not too far from here. Where Correct. It, been it would have been just a further, a little further west. You're saying Fox Hill? Because Fox Hill... Not as, far, not as far west as Fox Hill, short of where the, the, the Bergen or Hackensack Turnpike would have been at that time. So what's there now? I don't know. So it would be Bloomfield. Okay. That's before a lot of these things are built. And we would have to find other photographs that are taken, let's say, 1870 mm -hmm. or whatever, that would give us that same background. Right. Give us a match because we don't have the tree. part of your placement mm -hmm. of this photo are we looking at tree tops? That, that's the other part. We're looking at a moderate tree line that is in the in the far ground of of, of ground that sits higher than the first class fields at set at the riverside. So there's a slope over there. Yes. Right? Yep. It would it look it gradual slope down towards the river, and again, we when you look at the when you look at the maps. The, the only way, the only thing we have is the maps, and the only depiction that we have on the maps of vegetation, they, they kind of, they show where the vegetation would have been, or at least the majority of the vegetation would have been. So, if this particular image, as I contend, was taken in the western part of the ball, the the, the park, the Jeff, the Jeff, basically the area with the, of the Jefferson grounds, where those newspaper men would come and play on their on their Saturdays. That vegetation would have been between them and that field, and the in the, in the balance of the you know, the Elysian fields going east. And it's flat now. Well, that tree line down below, there, this was raised up, mm -hmm. and there was a gentle slope. You had those trees. Because I was wondering from the image, you don't see any trunks, so I'm thinking you're looking at the you're looking at the tree tops. You're looking at the that or what kind of vegetation is it? Is it, you know, is it the shrubberies that is described in the literature? Is it full grown trees? I, there's parts of it that we don't know. Right. And then for the background, from that angle and thinking about it, have you sort of figured out what part of New York that would be? And would there have been a church steeple that might faintly show up built in the 1850s? I don't think any of the landmarks of new york based upon the you know that, that that stereo view we showed that was taken at the i'm gonna go back to that i think that's it's one you of couldn't the, capture distance on, in photography in those days I'm not sure. uh, this was a stereo view taken of the waterfront right, right. right on the waterfront the whole the hoboken waterfront in the mid 1860s 1860s right. and that's new york in the in the in the in the, in the far ground right. that's taken directly from the waterfront sure. and there's <laughs> Nothing discernible. Right, but I still want to see it blown up just to see if I see the paint little. We have the we have the high resolution scans. Right. And we have that. Yeah. No, I just we have to see. It. I want it to work. I believe it's Hoboken. I just don't know if it's. Are field. you being contrarian? <laughs> no. Sorry, there's only room for one know. contrarian in this room. Like and um, so. Uh, I'll just say collodion was, like you said, a wet process, and so that meant a glass negative would be coated. Mm -hmm. So it's a negative process, so we have a print on the negative, not one of a kind. You mentioned there's another one that all works. Mm -hmm. Very few people would be set up to show up and do that type of process. The newspaper thing works, and newspapers would not reproduce uh, shall we say a dog pattern type process until later, usually what would happen is a photograph might be taken and then an artist would do an engraving based on the photograph. And so some of the images you showed that were engravings, you know, could have been through that process too, we don't know, but that's why many people associate them with being pretty accurate 
Because they might. They, they might. We have yet we to, to know. I mean, the, the, the technology existed. I, I mean, I, I figured that the, 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 grand, the grand match in eight, August of 1865 was such a big deal. Right. The technology existed. Sure. But where's the photograph? Right. So my gut feeling is, um, you know, the picture is authentic, the stamp really is beautiful, connections, you know, well, not too good to be true, but it just helped seal the deal. And of course, we're playing the Hoboken here, so we're kind of raw, raw there. But I just don't know where it is. And right. So yeah. I was getting the sense you were saying these were the two fields close to the colonnade. No. And I didn't. Uh, nope. I didn't agree, so I misread the binder. Yeah, no, it is not. It is. It is not, in my opinion, one of the two fields, the two first-class fields so to the I north and south of the colonnade. Would I see New York in the distance from those locales? I just don't know. So it's going to be fun to kind of sure. think about that. The Stevens family were avid photographers themselves. Um, were involved in different camera clubs in the area. Would they have taken, you know, because not your average person is not going to be able to photograph uh, with Colonia. Uh, it was, like you said, you would need a tripod, you know, with all the uh, like a professional. Sure. By the way, in, in all my readings, there's a question back there, in all my readings of 19th century baseball, and at Legion Fields especially, I'd never come across any references to teams based in Hoboken, Hoboken-based teams. There were always teams from New York, teams from Brooklyn. Right. Uh, mm. There was a team at Irvington. There mm -hmm. were teams all over New Jersey. So I asked John Thorne. He is the official historian of Major League Baseball. I emailed him uh, yesterday, and I said, John, were there any teams based in Hoboken in the middle of the 19th century. And he answered me within 10 minutes. Uh, and John also said that John uh, researches faster than anyone who can do it better and does it better than anyone who can research faster. So within 10 minutes, he answered me and sent me documentation that the Monmouths of Hoboken played in 1867 the Hobokens of Hoboken, they were also often called like the, uh, the, the, na the name of the team, the Irvingtons, whatever they were. Um, the Hobokens of Hoboken played 1859 to 1860, and the Hudsons of Hoboken played in 1859. And there were, uh, the, Hudson, the Hoboken team uh, in, I think, 1859 had a record of uh, zero wins and six losses. So they were not very good, I guess. And there were some people named Stevens on these teams as well. There was a question. Jill. Oh, so we're looking at Is baseball a northern, originating in the north? I'm trying to say, like, are we just seeing it from the northern perspective? Was it in the south also? Brooklyn and Manhattan and Hoboken were the cradles. There were other games. It was something called the Massachusetts game. I mean, wait, wait. Yeah. There was something called the Massachusetts game up in Massachusetts. Five bases. Mm -hmm. Well, the baseball was starting to spread in the middle of the 19th century before the Civil War. It was starting to branch out a bit. During the Civil War, baseball partly went into suspension because the young players were off fighting. When they came back, they had been in the South, they spread baseball everywhere. Baseball exploded after the Civil War. It was everywhere. It was in San Francisco. It was everywhere. But at that point, there were these two competing games, the New York game, four, four bases, and the Massachusetts game, five bases, and variations all over the place. Because again, there wasn't a, a uniform body of rules, but eventually the New York game one out over the Massachusetts game, and people uh, embraced four bases instead of five, and eventually the rules evolved. So because we're more industrial and not based on agriculture as a lifestyle, so much as the development. We were cooler. I mean, Is that that's yeah, what you I mean, right? Here, but the Scots, I the Scots are in the South, and like, you know, I, I'm not sure I could answer your question. It it happened up here. It certainly did. It, it certainly developed. But it's it spread it spread quickly. 
It um, also spread – one of the reasons baseball originated, it wasn't people wanting to go out and form a team and let's play baseball. They were clubs. They were social clubs. Mm -hmm. Often they were in trades, firemen, policemen, uh, municipal employees, postal workers, whatever. They would get together and say, we're going to form a club. And you'd have all these members in the club, many of whom didn't play. They were just members of the club. They would support. They would pay their dues. And, and you'd pick the best players in the club – to be re represent you on the field and it, what you'd play a game and then you'd have a banquet and everyone would give speeches. It was an event. It wasn't simply let's go out there and clobber the other team. It was let's go out where a bunch of gentlemen will play a game of baseball, see who the winner is, and then we'll go out and get drunk and give speeches to each other and toast each other. Uh, uh, one of our colleagues, Tom Gilbert, uh, a wonderful researcher and author wrote, wrote a book called how baseball happened. If you've not read it, you should. It's, it's wonderful. And, one of the things I took from it, and quite simply, is baseball spread, particularly down in the South, um, when we talk about it spread to the South, where people traveled to. If there was a place of commerce, place of a hub of transportation, train uh, cities and towns where trains would run through, ports where ships would dock, that's where baseball spread first. And then it would spread out from there. And what happened was these clubs became more competitive, and they really wanted to win. Well, how do you win? You get good players. Well, what if you, your club isn't, doesn't have enough good players? Well, you go out and find guys who are really good and you pay them a little money under the table. Maybe you give them a no-show job. So that started happening. Who was the first professional player? It may have been Jim Creighton. Because the, the teams he played for, they wanted him so badly that other teams would have competed. So they gave him a little something. They gave his father a job. They bought him a home, whatever. So by the middle of the 1860s, there's very little acknowledgement of payment, of professionalism, but it was happening, no question. And the first openly professional team were the Cincinnati Red Stockings of 1869 and 1870. They said, we're getting paid. This is our job. We're going to go out. And they won like 70 games in a row. They slaughtered the competition everywhere. The Cincinnati Red Stockings, who ceased to exist. The, the, in, in 1871 was the first league, the National Association, the first official league. Cincinnati Red Stockings ceased to exist at that point. They disbanded. They wanted to remain amateurs. They didn't want to join a league. So most of them went to Boston and became a, a powerhouse club in Boston. So then, um, referring to the uh, whole book that you represented, on 11th Street and Washington, what, 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 what is that representing? <laughs> it, it's a chamber of commerce. Um, uh, and, it's it's a it's a tourist uh, uh, artifact. It's a uh, it's decoration. What does it actually represent? It talks about a game played on July 19th, June 19th, mm -hmm. 1846. There was a game played there on that. Well, there was a game played, mm, probably not, somewhere, probably in the Legion Fields. There was a game, and they have the score sheet, so they know who played. But subsequent research has revealed dozens, maybe hundreds of games that we now know were played before then. We just don't know what the score was. We, we may know what the teams were and where they played. But no one kept an official record of it. But often they were mentioned in the newspapers. You know, that a game was played. That's all. doesn't say who won or who played or who pitched or anything. So we do know that that, that is something of a landmark because it's the first documented game of baseball. Just a trivial follow-up to that. Um, what, what always bothers me, maybe it shouldn't, is that I, I think at this point, home plate is always uh, at the south West spot. Where, where Maxwell's was. What? Where Maxwell's? No, that's southeast. Well, I, or Helmer's. I, I remember my baseball from Medicine and home plate was at the southwest corner, and then uh, first base was at southeast, and and you went clockwise. So. <clears throat> Was this standardization something that came later? No, I don't think there was ever that kind of standardization. Isn't that standard now? In the Not world? that I'm aware of. Oh, no. I, I, the Yankees faded. Well, 
Sample. You build a ballpark and you just you put things where there's room to put them. You, they don't. They, they're not trying. They may be trying to avoid the sunlight at a certain time, but these days that that ceases to be a factor when you've got sunglasses and. Um, okay, thank you. Yeah. I've written books, but not about baseball. I've written books, but not about baseball. I. There are better researchers than me. I'm too lazy. To right. do what he did. And, uh, at some point, will you get like a seal of approval that this is authentic or equal to? Is that the process? Well, the, the, the question would be what is how, how does one define authentic? Um, is the image authentic? Yes. Is it date to that period? Yes. Do I firmly believe the inscription on the back is correct? Yes. I believe it's authentic to the extent that authentic could be. Where we go back. We know it's Hoboken. Was it there or was it there or was it a little bit over there? Uh, unless I, there's further evidence that, that I kind of wish there was. I, like I said, I think as, as long as, as the longer we research, the longer we look into things. Um, I've said this when I, pre I presented shortly after the conference. This conference, I presented this on a Saturday, came home on a Sunday. That Monday night, David Krell of the uh, Legion Fields chapter of Sabre asked me to speak on the same thing uh, during that chapter meeting. And the, the one thing I wanted to, to make clear was that it's the, the, the process of research is, is a living thing. And should additional findings come along, research come along, uh, whether, it's, whether it supports it or contradicts it, I'd be open to it. I think we all should be simply because that's what research and learning is all about. Um, but as, as of where it sits and stands right now, um, like I said, this is the third presentation I've done, and I'm 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 all ears for for additional thoughts and and you know inquiries. Cooper's They don't purchase. I don't believe, at least. Um, this was born out of the presentation at Cooperstown. I've not had any you know additional uh, dialogue with them. I'd be happy to just give them a copy of the image. You know, more more than happy. I think it's 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 out there now. I shared the image up at Cooperstown, similar to the way it's being shared here today. Um, my hope is that the museum is able to post it to their digital archives, so everyone has access to it. And that's the you know that's the only way that you know more. It's the only way we can learn more from it. Whether or not anything more definitive can be determined from it, I don't know. The more people who see it, the more clues may emerge. Someone may have one of these somewhere in their in a trunk in their attic, and it says. Is my uncle Jim playing baseball in 1865 in Hoboken? That's him, the third one from the left, or something. Oh, mm -hmm. this is a guy named Jim, or you know, someone could could say it was it was a newspaper nine, and they wrote it on the back at the time. So you're saying the stamp on the back is an indication that it was sold. It was yes, it was a tax. That it was, it was taxed. It was taxed and purchased. And yeah. It sold. Yep. They only did that for a two-year period. Right. And why would somebody purchase a picture like this? Back? You know, it, Unless it was them. If it was them playing, um, some of the reason why, you know, we, we go to these tournaments and purchase pictures of our kids playing. It's, yep. We know who it is. Yep. Ten customers. We right purchase here. it. Um, there was also a pension at the time to, to for individuals to have imagery of things they were interested in. They can go and buy a CDV image of Abraham Lincoln because he was the president. They would go buy a CDV image of another prominent or important figure. Um, the the, the the, the nature of the CDV was was great because it could be reproduced and it could be sold. There are there are other very very desirable, high value and hard to find CDV images of teams out there. You know they'll come up for auction every once in a while. They're not a singularity. There's a number of them. There might just be a handful of them, but they're out there, and that's what it was for. It was to be to be reproduced, purchased, shared, traded, you know, whatever whatever the case might be. So like I said, I know of another one, the exact same image. There may be more. Do we know what's on the back of that? There's faint. There's there's a tax stamp. It too has the tax stamp, which is nice. Um, there's very faint writing in pencil that you know with high resolution scans, and we're able to kind of superimpose things like that. Um, we're still working on that part of it. Like I said, the other image is in New Jersey. I do know the individual who who, who owns it, um, and this has kind of been a you know uh, this has not been a singular venture by by any means. Um, from the time this started till till now, it's it's been a, a process of of getting with other researchers, asking the questions, um, 
it was it was I was well like a year into this before I even moved forward with you know what what we, what we we saw here today. For the first year, I tried to convince myself that this could not be the only image. There must be others that this is wrong. This doesn't make sense. One, I kind of ran that ran that to ground. Then I said, well, let's pursue that it is, and that's when the rest of it came about. We take for granted nowadays that photographs are so common that they're everywhere. You go to a flea market and you see albums of old photographs and, you know, you could buy them really cheap. Old, incredibly old, sepia tone, uh, whatever uh, photographs. But if you could find, let's say, a photograph of Sarah, uh, Sandra Bernhardt? Sarah, Sarah, <laughs> Sarah Bernhardt as a child or something. I mean, that's an incredibly rare artifact. Back then, these were rare artifacts. There were people seeing a photograph for the first time in their life. I'm just wondering, what is, is that really, is that real? It's a reproduction of reality on a piece of paper. So that, that had to be very, very special at the time. And that would partly explain the appeals uh, of the CDVs. And just too bad that it doesn't have a photographer studio. No, it's market. true. True, that would, that would. Many cartridges. Many do, many do, many don't. But yeah. just kind of, of uh, one of those things that they used whatever, you know, the backings that they had, some were blank, some were very ornate. Um, but that would have been another, you know, another great clue. Probably not. I belong to something that, for for lack of a better description, I'll just call it club, mm -hmm. that is always trying to raise money. And we often will take a photograph of an event and create it into something, and then you buy it. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering, let's say it was baseball. Mm -hmm. the, the, the newspaper man, mm -hmm. and, and they had their club, and they were going to have an annual dinner, and they need to raise money for the dinner. Maybe they hired someone to do a number of these, and it was like you buy this um, as a, a, it's a souvenir. It, it's a souvenir, a sure. Souvenir at it, and you know what it is. You don't need to describe it more than a game of baseball and logo. Just like we would write if we were at a barbecue, you know, barbecue at grandma's house, 1988. I've got, you know, those guys, I've got those photos and, you know, know you know that, you, you know, because you, in what you're writing is just for you. This is just a reminder. So maybe yeah. this, oh, nothing more. And that, you know, again, to me, as, a, as someone who's seen these for a long time and looked at these, it kind of lends more credence to it, that it, it's nothing embellished. It's nothing over the top. It's nothing special. It's just a game of baseball where and where it was played. But the likelihood, as you mentioned, that someone actually uh, dragged all that equipment out there and staged this for no reason would would it almost imply there is some reason why this exactly. particular image, why these people, why this team, like we're gonna whatever. We're going to have our annual dinner, and we're going to have the souvenir photo, and it'll only cost you five dollars, which could be what about two hundred fifty today. Yes. yes. Therein lies the mystery of history. Yes. And then you would not necessarily need to have the name of the maker on it. It wasn't even done to be sold to the public, where you get the publicity of the person who took the photo and self publicity. Just a thought. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Last, last call. So you're going to let us see the image? Yes. You're going to get copies yep. of it, right? Yep. And We're going to give I you. I just want to thank you, John, for this uh, legacy building project. I appreciate it. I very, very much appreciate the uh, the opportunity to be here today, um, and the opportunity to, to share it, share the research, and sh share it for posterity. Yeah, and uh, probably we aren't tied in with Cooperstown, so Erwin being a friend of the museum, Hoboken resident, love of baseball, Erwin, thank you for playing. And I want your, just remember, you are all deputized when you leave here. And somebody says, oh, you live in Hoboken. I hear that's where baseball started. Please correct them. Please, clar please clarify. Oh, I, I've, I've started fights with, with people over there. Baseball did not. Can we authenticate it? Can we raise our hands? Sure, go ahead and vote. Oh, absolutely. We are the authenticating body until proven otherwise. No, I mean, just that the ticket for the game, you know, that's before. The Magnolia. The Magnolia, Magnolia team. Right. Is before the right. no, I'm yeah, 1844. Mm -hmm. No, I'm authenticating the Senate. Yeah, yeah. Uh, even the Magnolia uh, ticket. The Magnolia ticket is. I mean, it it too is a singularity. Yeah. There was not only one made. To your point, there was there. It was made. It was a ticket for that club for an event. 
there was not just one made, but there is only one known. Right. I never, I had never seen it until you put it together. Yeah. And I'll say that I, you know, over the years, there's been a few baseball presentations, but never with the depth, clarity, and uh, it expands because you cover a lot of fields and a lot of locations that you have, you know, made history for us. You know, how I appreciate that. I really enjoyed it, by the way. So I hope you had a good time too. If you're, uh, you asked if, if I'm going to write a book, I don't have to because the books exist already. If you want to read, let's say, three books about the origins of baseball and rife with Hoboken lore, one is Baseball in the Garden of Eden by John Thorne. He was an amazingly entertaining writer and researcher. Uh, you mentioned Tom Gilbert's How Baseball Happened. Tom explains, we know the where, we know the who, we know the why, but he explains the how. And it's really interesting how baseball evolved. And the third one is David Block's uh, Baseball Before We Knew It, where he traces, he'll trace baseball back to ancient Egypt. I mean, he really does an amazing hi historical thread of how baseball came, came to evolve from various sports, one of which was not Rounders. Rounders was not a forerunner of baseball. Uh, again, another one of these myths that people talk about. Um, but stool ball was. <laughs> what was the second book you mentioned? Uh, there's Baseball in the Garden of Eden by John Thorne. Uh, How Baseball Happened by Tom Gilbert, which just came out a few years ago. In fact, John's book came out in the last 10 years. And Baseball Before We Knew It by David Block. They are all still alive. They are still researchers. Tom Gilbert lives in Brooklyn. He used to do uh, tours of Greenwood, Greenwood Cemetery, where there are a lot of very well-known 19th century baseball figures buried, including Jim Creighton. Jim Creighton's uh, monument is there. Again, died at the age of 21. And there's a baseball on top of his uh, the, the monument. You gave me a bunch of these, right? Yeah, that's some of yours. Cool. And uh, so each person should have get one of these. So we're sitting up here. 